Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our uh, campus COVID-19 briefing. Uh, please note that we'll have live captioning and ASL translation available today, and the recording, as always, will be posted later in the day. But today, we'll be able to go until about 2 p.m., and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And you could ask questions, of course, using the Q&A function. Uh, this is our final scheduled briefing of the spring. Uh, in the future, we'll reschedule these as needed uh, and be sure to send out invitations in advance. We very much appreciate your engagement over these uh, few months. Uh, this is now our 20th briefing I learned earlier today. Uh, today we're joined by Provost Susan Collins, Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon, Chief Health Officer, Preeti Malani, and Michael Konjoka, the Vice President of Programming for the University Mus Musical Society. Uh, almost daily in recent weeks, uh, the governor has been announcing changes to our state's back to normal plan. Uh, yesterday, she announced new timelines for increases in capacity for indoor and outdoor gatherings, for example. Uh, on June 1st, indoor capacity limits for events will increase to 50%. And as of July 1, the state will no longer limit capacity at indoor or outdoor gatherings. Uh, the continuing but slow increase in vaccination in our state is leading to more optimistic projections and a faster return to normal life. The state and federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have also recently issued new guidance on face coverings. We're examining all of these changes in CDC and state guidance that have been made in recent days, and we're also waiting for more guidance from uh, Michigan Occupational Self and, and uh, Health and Safety folks, uh, which still has workplace health and safety measures in place uh, now. Uh, an important detail of the CDC masking announcement is that while it says vaccinated individuals do not need to wear masks, it also says that state, local, and workplace guidelines should still be followed. Monitoring public health conditions locally and regionally will always be a guiding factor for us at the University of Michigan. When we have a bit more information, we'll reconsider our distancing policy, density guidelines in our research labs, and our indoor and outdoor masking policy. We anticipate new guidance being pushed out to campus in the coming weeks and maybe even sooner. Currently for masks, we're still requiring them indoors with exceptions that include those in their on-campus residences, alone in their offices with their door closed, or those who are socially distanced while eating and drinking indoors. Please note that school and college and unit plans do not need to be accelerated based on the back to normal thresholds. Our previous guidance remains in place that units will determine when more in-person work is needed. Uh, I know that planning is underway all around the campus. Uh, Governor Whitmer's announcements yesterday are great news for Michigan athletics and for our student athletes and our fans. Uh, based upon this latest order and what we now know, uh, this guidance from the state of Michigan clears the path for Michigan athletic events to return to full capacity, beginning with the fall competitions. Uh, this includes Michigan Stadium, the big house. Future changes to federal, state, local, or campus public health guidelines may require changes, but for now we anticipate fans at all Wolverine sporting events this fall. Uh, of course, it remains critically important to continue our drive to vaccinate as many people as possible. Things have slowed down around the state in the last couple of weeks. Uh, on campus, I know the vaccination rates are high, uh, but the more people we can vaccinate, the more normal a semester we can have. And uh, not just the healthier you are as an individual, but the safer we are as a community. Uh, it's very important to us that our students uh, report their vaccination status online. Uh, this will allow them to avoid weekly COVID-19 screening tests, and avoid quarantine if they've had simple exposures to infected persons. Uh, so far, we've had more than 13,600 students uh, submit and have validated uh, their vaccination information. So that's fantastic, that has to keep going. Uh, it remains extremely important that everyone who hasn't been vaccinated gets their shots as soon as possible. Uh, we promise more information on vaccination requirements, incentives to help drive higher and higher rates of vaccination, and of course, changes in campus COVID-19 policies uh, just as soon as we possibly can. Uh, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Milani to give an update on campus conditions and discuss a few other aspects of what's going on in the pandemic. 
Uh, Preeti? Yeah, thank you. So since the beginning of the pandemic, campus has been a reflection of the community. We've said from the beginning that campus can never really be safer than the community in terms of COVID. And the waves that we've seen on campus have corresponded closely with waves in the rest of the state. And the good news is, is numbers are dropping. They're dropping exponentially and they're dropping everywhere. Cases and deaths. And this is really remarkable for people who like to follow those epi curves like, like myself. It's a really a good news story. And on campus, of course, we have very limited numbers of students here right now that are you know, enrolled students. And last week there were seven cases and I believe there are three this week. So this dramatic decline, it, it didn't happen magically. This is because of vaccination. And we think about just even a month ago or six weeks ago, the story was so different in our state. And we keep learning more and more about vaccination and it looks better and better, both in terms of effectiveness and safety. Now with nearly 300 million doses given and I know uh, President Schlissel has said it, and I'll say it, you know, this is one of the safest vaccines we've ever seen. And the CDC guidance that's come out in recent days, to me, it basically says, if you're fully vaccinated, you can start getting back to most things. You are protected. And there are caveats, especially for individuals who are immunocompromised. And in those cases, you really have to have a good discussion with your uh, medical providers to figure out what you need to do to protect yourself. But to me, this is the strongest endorsement of the benefits of vaccination that we've seen. And people know the CDC doesn't move very fast. So all of this guidance, of course, needs to be taken into context with community spread. But we're starting to really see that come down as well. Uh, once again, I want to appeal to those who are still not feeling confident in the vaccine. You know, get good information. Have a conversation, ideally with your doctor or another healthcare provider that you trust. But the decision for my family was easy. But I recognize that some people are nervous and that there's confusion. There are questions about side effects. But for others, it's logistics. You know, our lives are complicated. You know, it's hard to schedule something. It's hard to get somewhere. Um, it's worrying that the vaccine might make you sick and that you won't get, you won't be able to go to work and you won't get paid. So we're talking as a group about ways to continue to improve uptake. And as President Schlissel said, you know, just incentives and, 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 um, more on that, but again, Washtenaw County overall continues to outpace the state. We're a very highly vaccinated county. Uh, when I think about last spring, one of the hardest things for me personally was the uncertainty and that things were changing like within hours, something in the morning was different in the evening. And we're kind of at that point right now where things are changing quickly, particularly in this last week. So that's hard. So please continue to be kind to each other, be patient, give each other room to adapt as we start moving more towards something that feels like normal, like moving back in person. And I know some people are, are nervous and we're, we're looking at what our campus needs to look like. Just because the rules have changed doesn't mean we can instantly make that adjustment, but those adjustments are coming. Uh, I would just like to say, you know, the risk of COVID is just, it's not gonna be zero. There are gonna be new cases. And when there are new cases, there are gonna be some that are severe. And most of these, almost all of them are gonna be in people who are not vaccinated or people who are severely immunosuppressed. But as community spread is controlled, for most of us who are vaccinated, the risk really can be negligible. So let's stay optimistic, but let's also be flexible and patient. And most importantly, let's keep vaccinating, share your stories, ask your friends and family if they haven't been vaccinated, why? And let's have these conversations. And I'm just gonna end with a plug. You'll see my background. It's from the Peony Gar Piano Garden from a couple years ago. Uh, I think people know this is a stone's throw from the entrance to Mod Hospital. It's um, a really spectacular place. And we've, we've uh, made that transition from winter to summer in Michigan. So uh, make plans to get out there, you know, go for a walk, uh, take, take some time uh, to go and visit, especially if you haven't been there. Thanks very much, Dr. Milani. Now I wanna amplify one thing that Preeti said uh, about being kind to each other. Uh, this has really been a very difficult year for everybody for many, many different reasons. Uh, and um, you know, I think all of us have been on edge. And I think people have uh, been more anxious, been more critical, been more concerned, uh, uh, been discouraged and depressed at times. Uh, and uh, remembering to give folks the benefit of the doubt and approach one another with kindness, I think will help us all come out of this um, much stronger. Uh, another thing I'll point out as I walk the campus the last few days, uh, my wife and I tend to take walks in the evenings, 
there are lots of still people, people still masked outdoors. Uh, and if you're comfortable wearing a mask and that makes you feel better, go ahead and do it. You know, there, there shouldn't be social pressure to unmask. Um, you know, people should be allowed uh, to develop their own sense of safety. You know, uh, Dr. Milani and Dr. Ernst and others, you know, we'll give you our very best advice. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, treat one another with kindness uh, and, uh, you know, be tolerant of how different people are coming out of this pandemic uh, period we've been in. Uh, for the last 40, 14 or 15 months. Um, across the university, you know, we're continuing our efforts to plan for the fall semester. Uh, today, we're going to provide a few updates in key areas that are helping us get ready to return to a much more normal residential uh, student, uh, faculty, and staff experience. So uh, let me start with Provost Collins on the fall preparations. Great. Thank you, President Sissel, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're very excited to be welcoming students back to campus this fall, and both Vice President Harmon and I today are pleased to share some of the plans for the classes of 2024 and 2025. So for our new incoming students, we've had questions about orientation in particular and whether that will remain virtual. And, and just to be clear, because there are many, many different types of events, um, orientation refers to activities like the placement tests, academic advising, and registration for classes. Um, and that's different from, distinct from the Welcome to Michigan activities, which I'll also mention in a moment. So orientation is already underway, actually, and it will remain virtual for this summer. We deliver orientation in partnership with advising units all across the schools and colleges, and their staff are in various stages of returning to on-campus work. The first year student program spans across two days. And for the in-person version, when we have done that historically, we would provide housing for two people sharing a room and using community bathrooms. And given the need for advanced planning and the evolving public health standards that were just mentioned, we really were not able to move forward with that in-person approach for this summer. Some have also asked why we couldn't simply invite fewer students just across more days. Um, and actually it's not simple. That, that is much easier said than done for a variety of reasons. We maintain a very carefully structured ratio between the school, college, academic advisors and the students to make sure that all of the new undergraduates whether they're entering freshmen or transfer students are registered before classes begin. Just to give one example, LSNA is committed to a one-to-one -one advising ratio to register their over 3,600 new first year and transfer students. So in addition, we have to plan any in-person orientation in the residence halls to be compatible with the housing needs during the academic year. And that actually limits how early orientation could start and how late it might go. So for those and other reasons, we are keeping orientation virtual for this summer. While it remains virtual though, we're really pleased and excited about a vibrant Welcome to Michigan experience, both for our new students, the class of 2025, but also for last year's class that entered the class of 2024, many of whom really did not get to have the University of Michigan residential experience because of all of the um, pandemic related adjustments uh, across campus. So Welcome to Michigan is a partnership between new student programs in the provost's office, in my office, and student life. Welcome to Michigan involves many departments and student organizations from across campus who join together to welcome students back. Um, there'll be dozens of events, both large and small scale, providing opportunities for students to participate in a number of different campus traditions, meet faculty and staff and meet other students and become familiar with campus as well as its resources. And just as a couple of examples, we're prioritizing in-person programs such as a new student convocation, which would be again for both of those classes, and Festival, student involvement fairs on both Central and North campuses. We're also providing engagement opportunities for both first and second year students that include outdoor welcome picnics for each class. And we're offering enhanced opportunities 
for student connections through small group tours led by students to learn about campus life and about the many resources that we offer. We're holding neighborhood gatherings, providing connections for students living off campus, and we're organizing football game day programs to encourage school spirit. Uh, so there's a lot that we have planned. We're really excited about it and can't wait to welcome our students back to campus. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to Vice President Harmon to share some additional details about what we're planning for the fall. Thank you, Provost Collins. And I'm, I'm really excited. Dr. Milani mentioned that we went from winter to summer. I don't know what happened to spring, but I love summer. So I'm glad that, uh, that we're, uh, we're here. Uh, student life is looking forward to welcoming students to campus this fall. As we've experienced this past year, central to a successful student experience at Michigan is student life's shared work with our campus partners. Uh, and, and in that work, we seek to build thriving, living and learning communities, to create opportunities for student engagement and connection, to encourage and support student health and well being, and promote a more diverse, equitable, inclusive Michigan. A focus for today's conversation is some forecasting for fall, as you've already heard. As we take a breath in May, our student life leadership is reflecting on our work over the past year to plan and launch an engaging and vibrant academic year for our students this fall. But I want to note that for first year students, your Michigan experience begins over the summer before you even set foot on campus. That's why Student Life is working on our Getting to Know Michigan initiative. Over the summer, we'll be reaching out to new students to help them get to know Student Life resources before they even come to campus. This outreach will include a series of webinars available throughout the spring and summer. And students and families are invited to join and learn more and ask questions. Now, what about when students get to campus? As Provost Callan shared, we're expanding the Welcome to Michigan program beyond a welcome week this year to help ensure students are familiar with and feel connected to campus. Rest assured that whether you're a brand new student or a seasoned Wolverine, there'll be something fun and engaging for you. Personally, I love the sound of those football game day events. I can't wait to attend my first game in the big house. Let's go blue. We, ha we haven't forgotten about parents and families either. Our exciting initiative that we are planning is for parent and family gatherings. These will be recurring reception type events during move-in for parents and families and other people assisting students during their transition to Michigan. So the siblings won't be left out. And of course, we'll continue to offer our, the weekly top picks email each Sunday during the academic year to help students stay connected and in the loop about events, programs, extracurricular, educational, and community bonding experiences that are happening every week. We're also exploring ways to expand our very successful resource navigation initiative by expanding to include all first year and second year students, as well as our residential graduate students. We'll be exploring opportunities to integrate those resource navigator experiences into the residential experience. In addition, our first year experience program initiatives include the Community Matters cohorts, which were a popular student life offering this past year, to the point that we've added extra groups. We had to add extra groups to meet the demand. I'm pleased to share that students will be able to meet new friends and make connections to the Community Matters cohort program and community meetups launching again this fall. Our first year experience office offers programs for students to build skills like time management, wellness, and more as they navigate the transition. So it's almost time for me to wrap up, but before I do, I wanna add that we don't do any of our planning uh, in, in a vacuum. We're making these plans for fall 21 based on feedback from students and staff, and we're using our student advisory boards and research and assessment every step of the way while keeping our strategic priorities in mind. We're really looking forward to this fall and we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Vice President Harmon. Yeah, I wanna use this as an opportunity to give a plug for an event that I host every year during Welcome Week. And I'd like, I didn't do last year, but I'd love to do this year's uh, ice cream in the president's house backyard. So 
I have a nice house here on South University and for our new students and their families uh, during move-in to, to stop by and join me outdoors in the backyard for ice cream is something I personally look forward to a lot and look forward to meeting a lot of my new students and their, their families uh, in the fall and late August. Uh, I now like to turn things back over to Provost Collins to give us some more updates about what's going on in the schools and colleges and introduce our special visitor today. Susan. Great, thank you. Um, and so as mentioned, um, I, I would like to continue on the theme of reopening and re-engaging and all that's on the horizon as we look forward. So with the significant drop in case positivities that we discussed earlier, our museums are preparing to welcome the public back using a ticketing system, perhaps as soon as mid-June. And that includes UMA, the Natural History Museum, the Kelsey and the Indoor and Display Gardens at the Matai Botanical Gardens, MBGNA. And so we're quite excited about that. Um, as President Schlissel mentioned earlier, we will be reconsidering our distancing and masking policies when we have a bit more information as things are still unfolding. And we do anticipate that there will be new guidance in the coming weeks, if not sooner. So as we look towards the fall, I'd like to give some updates from one of our units, the School of Music, Theater and Dance, which is excitedly preparing for more in-person activities and the possibility of welcoming audiences back to our stages. And so here are just a few of the examples of things that uh, are in, in planning stages. So once distancing and contact restrictions have been able to be lifted, SMTD's dance department and Department of Musical Theater will be able to incorporate partnering into choreography, which is really an essential, both technical and also expressive element for any dancer's education. For musicians and theatrical performers more generally, they were able to do quite a bit of musical performance this year, but only with big distances between musicians to mitigate the transmission of virus. Uh, often that meant having some of the performers actually in the audience spaces. So as we return to more normal uh, types of engagements, again, it will be possible to place musicians in closer proximity, allowing them to coordinate and blend their sounds in the ways that of course uh, we are uh, so used to. And we're also very eager to be able to put actors into true ensemble situations, allowing for freer motion and contact in a variety of different ways. And SMTD is also very excited about the return of audiences. Performing for audiences, again, will both enliven our campus in lots of exciting ways and allow for the full educational experiences for our students. How a performer responds to an audience is an essential part of the educational experience. So next year, we anticipate bringing in audiences into our university productions main stage season in the Power Center, the Lydia Mendelssohn and Arthur Miller venues, as well as having concerts in Hill and Rackham and recitals and presentations in Stamps, Britain, and so many other spaces across campus. So SMTD probably won't reach the fully 900 events that they did pre-pandemic, but certainly hopes to have hundreds of offerings for the general public and our campus community and be part of really reinvigorating our campus life. So we're very excited about that. Thank you. That's great. Well, you know, more opportunities for in-person uh, events are a key part of university life. And, you know, one of the things I miss the most is uh, not being able to walk over to Hill Auditorium and hear a fantastic uh, performance uh, uh, sponsored by the University Musical Society, UMS. And we're fortunate to have join us today, uh, Michael uh, Kanjoka, who is the uh, vice president of UMS in charge of programming. And he'll tell us about what to expect uh, when the fall season gets underway. Michael, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks, President Schlissel. Um, it's really fun to be the special guest and it's fun for me to be able to share some of the enthusiasm we have at UMS at Look Forward. Last week, UMS announced its 143rd season of live music, dance, and theater. It would be a gross understatement to say that um, there weren't a lot of emotions associated with that announcement for the staff, for the artists we work with, for our audiences and for all of the partners throughout the university community that are engaged 
in the work that we do. Um, you know, the emotion, obviously excitement, relief, optimism, and of course, a little bit of anxiety. I think um, back to what Dr. Malani said, I mean, the coming out of this creates a very different set of anxieties as the going into it. And um, it's been an especially called time for the performing arts sector where the lights were um, literally turned off very quickly. So the, the mixed emotions and the excitement are just um, welcome and sometimes a bit overwhelming. We have a long planning horizon at UMS. And so nine months ago, if you can imagine back nine months ago as we planned this coming season, what a different time that was. We couldn't, we couldn't really predict what we would be dealing with as we plan this season. But the one thing that I know for certain, and I can't be emphatic enough about this, is that we're hopeful that an effective vaccine would arrive that would allow for people to feel safe and um, to re congregate in venues around performance. And that is one of the, the key reasons why we're here today in announcing a season because the success and efficacy, continued efficacy of this vaccine is really helping us um, move forward with our plans. One really important data point, UMS during the, the um, as the lights have been out, one thing we've been doing is surveying our audiences both here on campus, locally, regionally, and nationally. We've been participating in lots of national surveying as well. And the data tells us that U of M audience are getting vaccinated at astonishingly high rates, well over 90% across all of our eight categories. So that also really um, a wonderful thing to share with you all. It's a reminder as well to everyone at UMS that we need to keep our eye on the prize and stay focused on safety as we move into next season for our audiences and flexibility because circumstances can and will continue to shift. And um, I want everyone to know that safety and flexibility are gonna be um, key focuses of how we think about delivering our season next year. Um, someone asked me to address why it's important that we come back together around live performance. And that is actually one of the easiest things for me to answer. And it's something that gives me a lot of joy to answer. We at UMS and frankly, the School of Music and anyone on campus who is producing live performance is in the business of creating experiences that are most often rooted in coming together, convening and congregating order that connect with artists and their visions and what they have to tell us. But also, and this is the thing that people sometimes forget, it's also about connecting with one another. And it's not just about connecting with who's on stage, but it's about connecting with one another. And for me personally, the reason it's so important, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to learn together as a community and to feel feel emotions together. And I believe the feeling of motion, emotions together that make us better individuals. Um, and while that's a personal statement, I think some of the people on the Zoom might agree with that. Um, I want you to know that we thought a lot about the emotions and the feelings that we want our audiences to be able to have this season as they come into um, performance. And I think that some of the emotions audiences could have this season are emotions of joy as sit in Hill Auditorium and experience Wynton Marsalis and the Jazz at Lincoln Center um, Orchestra on Thanksgiving week and welcome people or the joy Caleb Teicher and his ensemble of swing dancers on stage in the Power Center um, creating a special evening around a Lindy Hop and swing music. It's a very joyful, exuberant experience. I think an emotion of healing is also the feelings that go around with healing are an important moment for us in this coming season. And there are a couple of projects, significantly a work, specifically a work that we miss from um, Kyle Abraham and Jay Lynn, who've created an, an evening of dance for the Power Center based on the Mozart Requiem. As we think about those 
who we have lost and how to think about moving forward. Or maybe it's the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra that will be in the Hilltorium and um, present a new arrangement of their seven last words for the unarmed. The feeling of hope for a better future seen through Chugan and Bernice Johnson Regan's adaptation of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower is a, a big part of our coming season. And, and then finally, <laughs> We very intentionally put a, a work at the very end of our season in the spring that will create an emotion and a feeling of wonder and comfort. It's Jeff Sabell's um, theater work entitled Home. And we put it at the very end of the season as a kind of exclamation point that says, we are home. And I would be remiss if I did not um, remind everyone that we also take a significant amount of joy in partnering with all areas of university in um, delivering this work to students, faculty, and the broader community, and to, you know, to develop the, the sort of contextual curriculum that supports it and deepens it. So it's, it gives me great pleasure to say, see you at the performance hall next season. Thanks very much, Michael. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm all set to go. Um, so <laughs> before we uh, move uh, back to uh, Dr. Milani, I'll host uh, some questions. Uh, I want to point out that uh, we do have a resource uh, put forward by one of our HR colleagues uh, on kindness. Uh, thank you for encouraging kindness. Uh, see, be kind, be well information. It's on the M Healthy. A website. And when we put up the recording of today's session, we'll put up on the screen that link as well. Uh, but uh, Dr. Milani, you want to host some questions uh, for the rest of our time together? Absolutely. And as that slide is coming up, I wanted to just thank Michael. Uh, I don't know if he's, he's still there. You know, Michael, I just wanted to... I'm here. Uh, get, back in January, UMS had the premiere of Some Old Black Man. And uh, I, right. I know many of us got to see that. And it was, it was remarkable because it was something you viewed from your home, but it felt like you were in, in the theater. It was really remarkable, but can you tell our, our, um, our viewers, listeners, how they can access that? Because I think it is still available. It is, people can visit ums.org and um, essentially search under digital offerings and some old black men is listed right there and it's on demand. I also, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a bit cheeky right now. Some further exciting news about some old man in the near future. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. So th these are uh, some questions that are submitted in advance. And then, um, and we actually have some live questions as well. So how will student evaluations be used in annual reviews of faculty? So I'm gonna give that question to the provost. Um, great. So we have received a number of questions about the use of the student evaluations as part of reviews. And so um, I just wanted to confirm how we are thinking about that and, and um, uh, you know, kind of summarize again what, what we have said in, in a variety of contexts. So yes, we do expect that those evaluations will play a role in the assessment of faculty activity. And in that context, we thoughtfully added additional questions to the evaluations to address specifically pandemic impacts and also for um, use in more broad information gathering. Um, I will note that overall, the student evaluations of teaching are actually quite similar during the terms of the pandemic to what those evaluation results have been in prior semesters. So uh, in that context, we do think that there is some valuable information there. At the same time, I wanna emphasize that we also expect teaching portfolios to be evaluated with reasonable flexibility and more holistically. So in particular, um, it, it should, it's important to be aware of both the potential bias of student evaluations, which is a longstanding, certainly not a pandemic specific issue, and also under COVID, the awareness of the challenges, the difficulties that our instructors have had adapting to new formats and the variety of other challenges that um, the recent context has uh, created 
and factors that really do make teaching more challenging. Um, so more broadly, reviewers should be considering teaching statements, course syllabi, classroom observations where those are available, as well as student evaluations. Um, and so they should just be one of multiple measures as we think about assessing teaching uh, and learning for the annual review. So when we've asked units to provide guidance to their faculty for assessing teaching in all personnel reviews, and to do so in the context of the pandemic, as well as to provide guidance to faculty about how they can address pandemic and related impacts in their own teaching statements. Um, so uh, that's some, an ongoing uh, reminder to uh, our uh, schools and colleges and, and chairs and to our faculty as well. So an important question. Great, and it, it kind of just all of it reflects that need for flexibility for everybody. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And, you know, just anecdotally, I actually heard a lot of great things about some of the pedagogy and some of the teaching techniques. So I'm glad to see that is reflected in the reviews. Uh, so the next question, will the university lift the limit on daily parking passes to support hybrid work schedules? So our favorite topic, parking, and I'll, I'll give this one to President Schlissel to comment on. Uh, you know, the simple answer is yes. So the, the prior limit of 60 uh, parks uh, no longer applies. Uh, there will be different options for blue, yellow, and orange parking, uh, but logistics, transportation, and parking has information about that up on their website. So we recognize that the nature of work is going to be different having been through the pandemic. And you know, of course, it's a transition period coming up, uh, but the new normal is going to include much more remote work for many of our uh, staff uh, than uh, before the pandemic. And of course, that's going to require different ways to approach the issue of parking. So uh, yes to the fact that we've listed, lifted the limit, more information on the transportation and parking website. Great. So this has been, uh, this next one is a topic that uh, we've heard a lot about, and I know I've heard about it in my circles as well. Recognize, recognizing that U of M can't control the Ann Arbor Public Schools, is the university considering ways to be helpful in mitigating the significant hardship to some employees that will result from uh, the decision not to offer the before and after school care. I'll give that also to the president to comment. Yeah, yeah, I certainly recognize how challenging that is. And, you know, I am in touch pretty frequently with the leadership of the Ann Arbor uh, Public Schools. And I know many of our faculty and staff have um, reached out to the schools in various ways and told them how important before school care and after school care is to everybody. Uh, to try to get everyone back to a more normal life. So I'm going to add my voice to those folks that are uh, calling upon the school system to continue to consider uh, ways to re reinstate um, uh, as soon as uh, safe and practical uh, before and after school care. Um, uh, Jeannie McAlpin, who's the director of our work life programs, uh, she's been on uh, this briefing uh, in the past. She's been working throughout the pandemic to identify uh, resources uh, for parents and guardians. A list of our existing resources is available on the additional child care section of the University Human Resources website. It includes family helpers, family to family, and care to care, uh, care.com um, uh, opportunities. Uh, we've also learned that the private Gretchen's House child care centers will be providing before and after school programs at several locations in the area. Uh, Gretchen's House is not affiliated with U of M, but their information is available uh, at www.gretchenshouse.com. And uh, I urge you to look in that direction if you had need for before and after school care as well. And, you know, we recognize that this can't replace large scale school based programs, uh, but we do want to offer the supports that we can. And we'll continue to work with and encourage the school system to um, uh, open up uh, before and after school opportunities as soon as they can do so safely as well. Yeah, thank you. And I, I would love to add my voice to yours, uh, President, on that. I know my family depended on that before and after care. When our, our children were small, it was a lifeline. So I, I hope they can figure something out. Uh, so uh, Vice President Harmon, how can I request an exemption from the COVID-19 vaccine so I can live in uh, Michigan housing this fall? It's a very timely question. Actually, students needing to request an exemption for medical or religious reasons, we'll be able to do so starting today. Details will be fully available on the housing 
FAQ page uh, later this, e uh, this evening or even this afternoon, including a link to the request form. But I'll share um, just a brief overview right now. The vaccination exemption request form through Wolverine Access should be available. I mean, I'm sorry, should be completed no later than July 16th, 2021. Of course, if you are requesting an exemption, you don't have to wait until July 16th, but that is the latest date because that allows sufficient time for all requests to be reviewed by the exemption review committee. Um, for students that are being vaccinated, please do not forget to fill out the uh, online uh, report form so you can be exempted from testing, quarantine if you do get exposed and other necessary precautions. And as President Schlissel mentioned earlier, over 13,600 UM students have already reported their vaccination, which is great. So our goal is really to provide a living environment this fall as close to possible to the dynamic social interactions that generations of Michigan housing residents have experienced, including you, Dr. Milani. So we appreciate your support with helping us to achieve this goal. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade those memories for anything. So I, I really look forward to, uh, to the incoming students having some of those same uh, same experiences. Hopefully they'll behave maybe better than I did. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's, that's for another time. Um, will students arriving in late August uh, be able to get a vaccine at that time? I'm an international student and it is currently impossible to get vaccinated in my home country. So I'm looking to get vaccinated once I'm back in Ann Arbor. And this is, this is something that uh, we've been discussing. I'm gonna ask President Schlissel to weigh in on this. Yeah, so we'll be all set up through the University Health Service uh, to vaccinate uh, international students that arrive on campus uh, unvaccinated. Um, we'll also you know, advise those students about how to stay safe and keep the rest of the community safe uh, during the weeks that it takes to get the two doses and have full protection kick in. So uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, and, and the list of approved vaccines is growing by the day. And, you know, this is, there's a long time to the fall. And, you know, one thing for any international students or people who are connected to international students who are, who are concerned about this is please um, don't be concerned. We will, we will support you. We'll work with you. And, you know, one of the questions I got a couple of days ago is from someone who was in a Novavax trial. And uh, that one is not approved yet, but it's a uh, kind of a special situation. Someone was in the trial, got active vaccine. It's an effective vaccine. It just doesn't have an EUA yet, and it's not approved by WHO yet. But again, you know, there are going to be some circumstances like that. Instead of going and getting revaccinated, talk to us, reach out, and we'll, we'll take these case by case. Uh, should graduate and professional students submit their vaccine records through the form on the Mason Blueprint webpage? And you know, I'll, I'll answer this quickly, which is yes. And you heard um, we've had 13,600 as of this morning. Uh, students submit primarily undergraduates, but you know that list is growing every day and we haven't made a big push yet to get these. So I'm gonna say that now is like, please don't wait, send your stuff. I know a lot of the students are getting their second doses right about now. Uh, so send that information, we'll, we'll get it uh, saved and verified. But the more uh, that people can provide, uh, the easier it's gonna be for us uh, to, to plan for the fall. And I'm gonna move on to some of the live questions. First one is on, um, it, does the medical community know how often booster vaccinations are necessary? I, I can uh, try to weigh in on this and then uh, perhaps President Schlissel can weigh in. You know, one thing to remember is that COVID is caused by a new virus and that these are new vaccines in the sense that we don't know how long protection is gonna last. And so far, the news has been very encouraging at six months the level of protection looks good, and it may indeed be much, much longer. And of course, uh, he can he can weigh in on that. You know, with there are the immune system is very complex, and so you can't really measure immunity all the time. I would say there are a couple different things that might happen. One is that protection could decline over time, and it could be months, it could be years. I mean, one reason to be optimistic is that we just we can't measure all the types of protection, so it could be better than expected. The other issue is is variants, and so far the vaccines seem to be protective, especially against B117, which is predominant in the US. And you know what, I would just say, if you need a booster shot, we'll get you a booster shot. It could end up being that you need them like you need flu shots, or it could be something in between. And 
Again, uh, President Schlissel, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, you know, the only thing I'd add to that is, you know, time will tell, but I think it's likely that boosters will be required. Uh, I think the good news is they're not going to be required incredibly frequently because the vaccine trial uh, first waves are, you know, out approaching a, a year now uh, or heading towards, you know, the past six months and towards a year and, you know, protection remains high. Uh, so um, there was some commentary by the heads of some of the pharmaceutical companies making the vaccines, arguing that you'll probably need a booster every year. It could be those companies are hoping you need a booster every year. It's good for business, uh, but there'll be good data that'll help uh, guide us. Uh, and unlike this first round effort to get everybody vaccinated all at once, we'll be able to do the boosters in a much more planned way when you get your regular medical care. And you know, an analogy is every few years you get a tetanus booster uh, your medical records from your primary care provider keeps track of what immunizations are due. So it'll become much more routine. And the other thing I want to mention is there are lots of people that have already had COVID. And, you know, sadly, there are hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps more that have passed away from COVID. But um, we don't really know uh, with great specificity the extent to which natural immunity protects you better or worse than the vaccine. Uh, there's some evidence that the vaccine is more protective than actually having had the infection and let your immune system naturally respond. Uh, the vaccine is very artificial. It gives tremendous immunity by the things we know how to measure. Uh, natural infection, when people recover, there are signs in their blood of antibodies and of other cells that fight subsequent infection, but they vary an awful lot from individual to individual. So that's why the CDC is recommending, and I would strongly encourage whether you've had COVID-19, uh, the illness before, you should still get vaccinated. It's not a reason not to get vaccinated, unless of course you're in the middle of a bout of COVID-19, then you'd like to wait until you're feeling well and a couple of weeks have gone by. Yeah, I would just uh, emphasize that. There's also evidence that a single dose can give you a very, very robust response along the lines of someone who hasn't had COVID who's had two doses, but the recommendation is still to do the two doses. And that's again, the CDC, that's what we would consider fully vaccinated. I recognize some people are going to make different decisions, but again, you know, we can only provide uh, the, the guidance. Uh, the next question, I'm going to give this one to uh, Provost Collins, is can you assure us that the fall instructor teaching policy will be tied to health risk, not job title? Um, so course modalities, the um, planning there is absolutely not tied to job title. Um, what uh, and the decisions have been made at the school and college level really based on pedagogical reasons and programmatic needs, not job title. So yes, I, I can certainly make assurances there. Um, I have another question for you. This one had to do with uh, travel. Uh, do you know when faculty will be able to travel to academic meetings or for other collaborations using university funded resources? So uh, as we said, and I know that there are many who are very eager to, uh, you know, as conditions evolve to get back to, uh, to traveling. And what we've said is that um, as our budget becomes finalized, that we will um, update our policies around the additional spending restrictions that we imposed when the pandemic first hit. I will note that um, for those types of expenditure restrictions that are still in place, that deans do have the ability to make exceptions, although we've asked them to have a quite a high bar in terms of how they kind of think through when they might give an exception to the remaining expenditure restrictions. Uh, the next live question, I'm going to give this one to President Schlissel. If I receive my vaccine through a UMICH vaccination site, is my vaccination status automatically, quote, reported to the university? Uh, absolutely not, actually. You still have to report it yourself. Now, students are the ones that we're asking to report, and we're all set up to receive reports of students who are vaccinated. Um, medical privacy dictates that, you know, we don't look at a, a Michigan medicine health record for our employees. Uh, we would never do such a thing without explicit permission. Uh, so uh, it, it, if you uh, are a student and you want to report your vaccine status, you have to do it, even if Michigan Medicine gave you the vaccine. Uh, right now, we're exploring uh, whether and how to set up a way for faculty and staff to report their vaccine status. 
so we're working on a, a sort of database mechanism that would allow us uh, to have people uh, you know, tell us their status or, or um, uh, consent to tell us their status, you know, because there's still privacy issues involved. Uh, but once again, we won't transfer any information directly from your private medical records. You'll have to do it and give us permission yourselves. Thank you. And the next question is, um, is for Provost Collins. This is about uh, merit raises, if and when. Uh, can you provide more information on if and when merit raises will occur? Uh, sure. Um, yes, there will be merit raises for our faculty and staff, and um, we'll have the details. So we have announced that there will be a modest merit program for our employees for this coming year. And we'll have more specifics to announce again as part of the fiscal year, the, the new budget um, by July. Since I have you, one more question for you here. Uh, when will the library open uh, for uh, normal stack access? So um, I, I can't give a specific time. I, what I can say is that there is planning underway within the libraries, just as there is planning across all of our units on campus as we're thinking about welcoming uh, people back for a more in-person experience. Um, there's planning underway for uh, more in-person access with the libraries as well. So I, I will note that in, in the current, uh, the way that things are, are currently working, of course, through the Happy Trust Emergency Temporary Access Services, the, those are all circulating online. Um, any circulating materials that are not available there is contactless pickup access. And that I believe is really working very smoothly. And that's both on North Campus and on Central Campus. And then for non-circulating materials, by appointment, um, there is access for all of those and also for specialized microform research collections. And so there are a variety of, of things in place for, uh, for the moment. And again, we would expect that um, we would have more information to share about changes for the fall uh, going forward. And, and also what I'll add to that too, Dr. Milani, is we recognize how important the library is to our scholars. You know. I'm a lab person, but I always look at the library as the research lab of our uh, humanist and social scientist colleagues, many of them. So I, I recognize how essential it is. Uh, and also getting materials online is great, uh, but there's also a power to being in the stacks as well that I, that I really appreciate. So, you know, it's a priority. We're gonna try to get this uh, going first in a limited way and then in a much more open way. And we'll do it, you know, as, uh, as early as we can safely get it organized. Yeah, that's good news. I know the students are also looking forward to returning to their study spaces. And uh, I'll take this question. Should employees who are working on site and fully vaccinated and are fully vaccinated continue to get weekly asymptomatic COVID testing? You know, at this point, if you are asymptomatic, there's not a lot of benefit to doing that weekly testing. And you know, again, I, I know some people are doing it for their peace of mind, but from a, from a public health standpoint, asymptomatic testing in someone who's fully vaccinated is probably going to be very low yield. And so we're not, we're not recommending it. And then Another uh, thing I'd say that's really important. Uh, one of the lessons learned from the pandemic, uh, when we're back to our transition period and new normal in the fall, um, if you're sick, uh, you really shouldn't come to work. And, and we have a culture here. Uh, perhaps it's our campus, perhaps it's academia, maybe it's the United States or something of sort of toughing it out and working no matter how lousy you feel. Uh, we have to find a way to make a commitment to one another and develop uh, workplace policies that make people feel comfortable staying home when they're sick, especially uh, with a respiratory illness where they're coughing and sneezing and, and transmitting disease to others. So uh, regardless of your vaccination status, because uh, COVID is not the only infectious disease, you know, we learned this year, for example, uh, we had almost no influenza on campus this year. It was just remarkable. And it's because people were wearing masks and they were in small groups and they were washing their hands more often than usual. So we should sort of keep the best of these COVID era uh, infectious disease precautions in place as we return to the new normal. Uh, so certainly you won't need asymptomatic screening tests if you're vaccinated, but if you have symptoms of an upper respiratory infection or sore throat, the headache, the list of COVID symptoms, whether you're vaccinated or not, you should get tested uh, still for COVID. It's still a widely spread illness. 
agree, agree full, fully with that. And I hope that that is something that stays with us in terms of just changing our culture. And then if I can bring Michael back, maybe this will be the last question. How can I get tickets to UMS events? Well, you know, I'm answering that question. Um, I would say the, the easiest way to get tickets would be to visit ums.org. And um, you can order tickets online. We're currently selling four event subscriptions. And then everything will go on sale singly later in the summer. Um, I also, I think since we're talking about tickets, it's important to say that um, we fully intend this coming year to offer our usual student ticket program for um, you know, both U of M students and students outside of the University of Michigan, um, our senior a rush program of tickets. So we anticipate we're going to be able to maintain most of our um, points of entry for uh, a purchase. That, that is a, a great way for me to hand this back off to President Schlissel to, to wrap us up. I think it's great. You know, it's really you know, great to hear from Michael. And then the other things that we have to look forward to uh, on the campus uh, starting in mid and late August and into the fall I believe we do have the date for convocation set, Susan. I know it's up on the web. Somebody asked in one of the questions uh, whether we've locked in a date for a, a convocation for both classes, both the uh, incoming freshman class and the returning uh, sophomores. So that, that'll be available up on uh, the web uh, as well. Uh, and, um, you know, think of the joy in the diag and think of the crowd in the big house and think of the audience at UMS and yeah, think of our musical theater students and think of warm, warm September evenings in the Diag and outdoor activities, indoor activities. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of good things to look forward to. Um, uh, so with that, yeah, I'd like to thank those of you that have been uh, tuning into this uh, town hall on, on a pretty regular basis. As I said, this is our 20th uh, iteration uh, of it. Um, uh, it's been a very useful way for us to hear what's on the minds of our community and us to uh, provide answers to as many questions as we can and to make announcements. And we appreciate you spreading the word, those of you that listen in to your colleagues and your friends, and that's all been valuable. Uh, we will do this again uh, when the time calls for it. If there are major changes uh, or if other major events happen, this format works very well. But otherwise, you know, I really wish everybody uh, a happy, healthy, uh, safe, productive, uh, restful, joyful summer. Uh, and uh, I know there are some students still in classes uh, for the uh, spring and summer semester. So good luck with your classes. I know our faculty, uh, all of our faculty and our graduate student instructors are busy preparing uh, to teach again in the fall semester. So good luck with all your preparations. Uh, we'll be putting out more information as it becomes available. Uh, we'll be rolling back a lot of the lifestyle restrictions that have been so challenging for us to deal with, but so important. Uh, and that'll all be coming in the weeks ahead. Um, so just again, thanks very much. Stay healthy. Get vaccinated if you aren't. Uh, have a great summer. Uh, we will have, continue to have weekly email updates and go blue.